Welcome to Party Politics, where we prepare you for your next political conversation. I'm Jeronimo Cortina, political science professor at the University of Houston. And I'm Brandon Roddinghaus, a political science professor here also at the University of Houston. Obviously, the weekend's upcoming and politics is complicated. We hope to get you comfortable for the weekend to come when you're talking politics with friends and family, hopefully in a civilized way, right? Just like they do all across the world. Exactly. <laughs> uh, the big news this week is that Ken Paxton, the attorney general in Texas, is facing an impeachment trial. There's been a lot of swirl around this, and we're going to give you all kinds of great detail in the deep. But first, we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in Washington. So we're not the only group <laughs> institution that's back this week uh, from a hiatus. Congress is back, but they, unlike us, face multiple billions of dollars in problems. So um, tell us what's going on in Washington and why we should care. <laughs> well, it's kind of a deja vu. Mm. Once again, back in May, remember yeah. when President Biden and the Speaker of the House were trying to get a deal to extend yes. a little bit more the funding for running the federal Just government. Just a couple more months is all we need, we promise. <laughs> so the current funding of uh, the federal government expires on September 30th. And if no action is taken as before, Guess what's going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> We're in shutdown mode. Yes. Which means a lot of things actually and tangibly to people, right? You're talking about national parks that are closed, social security offices are closed, local Medicaid, Medicare offices are also closed. Just basically the government ceases to function. And we've been here before, sadly, I in don't a couple know how of many different times, cases. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we almost lose track after right. a while. But it is important. And honestly, it's one of those things that we have to have the government do. They have to be able to come to an agreement on this. And like you say, if they don't buy, um, you know, the October deadline, then essentially government gets shut down. Um, they're also working on trying to pass a $40 billion supplemental spending package, which has also been the point of some contention. This is funds for natural disasters, enhanced border security, and the ongoing war in Ukraine. Obviously, there's lots of political friction about this, um, not necessarily about the hurricane that hit Florida or the fires in Maui, but rather about the Ukraine situation. So once again, some things don't change. They're still fighting and still unable to find some kind of agreement. But what do you think the likelihood of them coming to some kind of agreement here is? I mean, it has to come to an agreement. But yeah. once again, the problem is that Speaker McCarthy is, you know, in a very awkward and complicated position. So back in May, before the summer, uh, he negotiated with President Biden some numbers yes. uh, in terms of, you know, let's ball pork it, uh, ball, uh, uh, park it here, yeah. there, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. But... Uh, <laughs> Within the Republican they lost caucus, the napkin, they wrote it on like. <laughs> well, I mean, they lost the napkin, and also the math that they are using is not the same math that you know that block of uh, the um, Republican yeah. caucus is aiming at different numbers, gotcha. which are very low. So, yeah. how they're gonna iron out the math? I have no idea, but it's gonna be. I think even more complicated because they already did this before the stop uh, gap uh, spending bill. And now it's like, you know, how it's the saying, yeah. uh, fool me once, <laughs> shame on me, <laughs> fool me twice, uh, uh, shame on me as well, or something you, you like can't that. You get fooled again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the whole point, right? I like the George W. Bush quote this early in the season. So we're, we're definitely like we're uh, on getting pace, ready on pace for a new season. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. I mean, this is complicated for McCarthy, not least of which is that inside his own house, inside the caucus, they're not sure how to proceed. Obviously, the kind of more right-wing Republicans want serious spending cuts, but it seems like nobody else does, including most Republicans. Yeah. But then they're going to have to negotiate with the Senate, right, where a lot of these things are just DOA, like that the Senate, including Mitch McConnell, is saying, like, these things are just simply not workable in terms of the budget. So it's unlikely that they're going to have a real firm home here. But we'll see. Uh, we'll keep an eye on this because obviously this means, you know, government continues yep. to function or it doesn't. Um, and who gets to be blamed for this is really important, too. And I think that's a big kind of quandary that right. all of these parties are thinking about, right? How can we make this kind of publicly good for us and how can we use this as leverage? Um, so that'll be an interesting development to watch. To say the least. But another interesting development is in Washington and inside the Senate cloakroom, and that is 
is the ongoing controversy about Mitch McConnell and effectively his age. Um, now, his partners the Republican Party are saying that he's fine. Um, one of the South Dakota senators who's also in leadership, Mike Brown, said, and I quote, he is perfectly capable uh, of doing the job. That is not resounding praise for the Senate majority leader. Uh. What do you think about this? He had a scary episode again this last week where he effectively froze during a news conference. Um, awkward to watch and frankly, right. pretty painful to see play out in real time especially for a fairly significant leader in this country. So what do you think is happening here and why do the Republicans stick by him? Well, I don't know why, uh, but first of all, it's a huge problem, right? Yeah. Uh, Nikki Haley over the weekend, yes, um, uh, she's the uh, one of the contenders for the Republican Party nomination for next year's uh, presidential election. She basically mm -hmm. said something that you know I think resonates around uh, the country, and you know, she talked about the age of some of these uh, elected politicians, mm -hmm. right? You also have Dianne Feinstein, right? Yes. Uh, even President Biden, even, you know, Donald Trump. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about people 75 and up. Yes. Um, which is yeah. interesting, Yes. <laughs> uh, to say the least. I mean, I'm not looking forward to be working at 70-something, yeah. oh, right? No, I like, I am definitely not going to be, yeah. Exactly. So anyways... <laughs> So I think it, it, it highlights that. And yeah. in terms of political representation has, I think, important implications, you know, you know, and we have started a lot of these things, mm. you know, Gen Z's, millennials, Gen X's, et cetera, et cetera. We have or they have a different perspective in terms of what needs to be done that some of these folks may not yeah. uh, uh, share. Even uh, the Senate majority, right, yes. uh, um, uses a flip phone. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, I like the old school throwback, but it's not intentionally yeah. that way. Like, that's just the phone that he uses. And so, yeah, I think that uh, obviously it doesn't exactly translate or relate well to right. the newer generation. And we're a very young country, right? And so yeah. I think that that's certainly a major disconnect. But I think the other part of this is that the fact that this is, I think, not selling well with people is problematic. I mean, the fact that there's just a lot of energy that needs to be employed in this job and people are worried that he simply doesn't have it. Right. And, you know, yet also he's the most powerful you know, politician in Washington. And so it's a sort of weird dynamic. Um, the other part of this I think it's interesting is that the Republicans are going to have to figure out what's next. Right? Yeah. I mean, who knows what will happen with the Senate in the next election and the balance of power obviously is sort of at play. But at that same time, they have to figure out who's going to be the leader and who's not. Um, my guess is that Mitch McConnell can't continue to be leader, that this will be his last yeah. go around at this yeah. um, for any number of reasons. Um, my guess is that they probably won't do as well in the midterms as they uh, or in the 2024 as they'd hoped. And so as a result, they're probably going to have to kind of switch gears anyway. Mitch McConnell probably would step aside at that point, leaving you know a host of other people, like I mentioned Mike Rounds, who's senator from uh, South Dakota, possibly Susan Collins, um, and possibly um, uh, Texas' senior senator, yeah. John Cornyn, yeah. um, because he and McConnell are very close. And that has been um, a kind of longstanding relationship where Cornyn has been sort of touted as the sort of next leader. Um, what do you think the likelihood of that happening is? And um, is Cornyn positioned enough inside the caucus to be able to build bridges, but also to kind of charge ahead where the right wants him to lead? Well, I don't think if, uh, if he's ready to charge ahead where the right uh, <laughs> wants him to be. Right. I, I see Senator Cornyn as, uh, you know, Someone that, uh, if you remember back in what it was uh, early two thousands mm -hmm. when he, when he was elected to the Senate, I think he has grown and matured politically, mm -hmm. right, uh, and becoming a more thoughtful senator uh, as time mm. has passed in terms of, you know, picking certain issues, right? And in some issues, siding with Democrats, some other issues, siding with, with, with Republicans. I think it would be a good, you know, yeah. change for uh, the Senate. And I would, you know, be thrilled to see Senator Cornyn become the next, uh, uh, you know, leader of the Republican Party in, yeah. the, in the Senate. Well, uh, the, you, you stopped me at, uh, or, or I wanted to stop you at uh, supported Democrats, because isn't this the sticking point, right? For a lot on the far right, especially for how it might shake out in terms of how the Senate 
looks, right? Because if the sort of things go as they're supposed to go, Nine. you're going to see some Republicans win in traditionally blue states, unseating Democratic senators, which means you're probably going to have a shift to the right. They may not be as likely to enjoy John Cornyn's like relationship with the Democrats as they are now. And I think you're right. The reason Cornyn is so good is that he's able to kind of understand where the chamber is Nine. and then maneuver it. He got some heat from, you know, passing bipartisan legislation Correct. on gun control. Modest as it was, it still was something that everybody agreed Nine. to and they passed. So um, those are the kind of things that got him into some hot water. Collin County had basically said, you know, we're going to censor you for working with Democrats, you know, tisk tisk. Um, is this going to hurt him Well, in Texas or no? I don't think he's going to hurt him mm. in Texas. I mean, uh, it's, you know, inter-party political dynamics, yes. you know, they start censor their own and that has <laughs> important implications also for, you know, electoral times that we'll discuss on another time. Yeah. But I think the Senate is different, right? Mm. Uh, the Senate is a small chamber. Yes. It's not uh, the House of Representatives where you have 435 individuals running like, you know, whatever. Right. Uh, and the problem here is that you need Democrats. Yes. Like, whatever you want to do, you mm -hmm. need them. Because they're not going to get to 60 no nope. matter what. So yeah, There's no help. way. Mm -hmm. So you need them. So if you put someone that is going to be a uh, fire, flamethrower, gasoline, et cetera, et cetera, nothing. Yeah. Nothing is going to done. And the Democrats are just going to be yeah. sitting back, relaxing, and enjoying <laughs> yeah. every single debate. Watch them take each other apart. Exactly. Uh, speaking of fire throwers, you have also the junior senator from Texas, Ted Cruz, uh, who's waited on this saying it's troubling. He says, obviously, age is something that all of us experience, and it's right. coming for all of us, not being very committal. Now, he and McConnell aren't exactly the closest of friends. Ted Cruz doesn't have that many friends in the Senate, so it's not... <laughs> I uh, guess that uh, kind of much of a stretch to say that he's probably not going to be in leadership, yeah. nor does he really want to be, right? Because obviously his sort of bailiwick is to be from the outside kind of throwing bombs in, like when he was on Newsmax, right, last right. week, like drinking a beer and then <laughs> reaction to the idea that like the Surgeon General said it was, you know, something you should limit. Um, I agree. Everyone needs to make their own choices. But at the same time, yeah, he's definitely likes to kind of stick, you know, yep. uh, uh, the bottle in, into the eye instead of <laughs> being uh, trying to smooth things over and drink it with colleagues. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I don't think uh, as of now, uh, yeah. Senator Cruz has a lot of chance to become the new uh, yeah. uh, leader of the well, Not gonna caucus get that in call. the Senate. No. But, but, yep. he's, but also the, he's a political leader in some ways. Right. Like formally speaking, they have to have someone to organize things inside the chamber. But there's also oh, kind yeah. of a political role that he Absolutely. plays outside. And he plays that very, very well. He does as, get as well as most. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But he's going to have to have a pretty tough fight in 2024. So we'll see how that plays out. Well, if you're lost in the political fray like the rest of us, have no fear. This is Party Politics. I'm Brandon Roddinghouse at the University of Houston. And I'm Jeronimo Cortina. Well, obviously, lots going on in Texas, too, this week, my friend. Um, ERCOT is once again asking people to conserve energy. What is your thermometer set at in your house right now? At the appropriate number, legally required of you? I mean, I, right now, as we speak, <laughs> it's around 79. Okay, that's good. That seems reasonable. And ERCOT is asking people and had asked people for several consecutive days in this last month to conserve power at a particular time. Obviously, the extreme heat is driving much of this uh, demand for power. Uh, Houston, in particular, tied the hottest day ever when it hit 109. It's brutal out there. And yeah. I guess the question is, is this going to be a political liability for Republicans if something tragic happens with the grid? Oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. it has happened on August 17, 20, 24, 25, 26, 27, 29. Uh, <laughs> You know, that seems like it's a lot. <laughs> conserve energy. <laughs> yes. uh, and, you know, it's a combination of various things, right? Is high demand, unexpected outages, uh, strain supply, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also in terms of how the grid is designed, right? It's designed because on certain days when you have, you know, gas plants and, and, and coal plants mm -hmm. generating uh, electricity and power, they also are, you know, to the, uh, there are uh, also feel, right, yeah. the problems of the heat. Yes. So that creates that they're also overheating, this and that, and yes. production starts, you know, to uh, decline. Yeah. So 
it's a very messy situation yeah. in terms of how they can do that. And then you have days that wind power was mm -hmm. not, the wind was not blowing enough, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. So it's a bunch of things yes. that is complicated, but those things are not going to change for next year. Yeah. It's going to be same thing. And I mean, try explaining that to people, right? When their power goes out and it's a hundred degrees. Oh yeah. And, and that's the real problem. And I think these politicians face. Um, now the legislature did do some things to shore up the grid with the hope that they would not have to face that issue. But the frequency of the conservation notice definitely is alarming and yep. worrisome. So we'll see how this kind of plays out, but hopefully things will get cooler <laughs> and it won't be as big a problem. But obviously we know that's not the solution to all of this. Um, Speaking of legislation, uh, there's a lot of legislation that the legislature passed this last session, sessions, I should say, right. um, many of which was very controversial. And so not surprisingly, a bunch of it ends up in the courts. So right. we've seen several of these things end up this week in the courts that have been paused, struck down, or are temporarily on hold. One is uh, health care for trans kids, Senate Bill 14 bans gender affirming care. This was um, paused by the courts and now the Texas Supreme Court is going to hear its fate. HB 900, which is essentially about books, basically it bans explicit books from school libraries and requires vendors to assign ratings to books based upon depictions on uh, references to sex in the books. Um, two bookstores, including one here in Houston, uh, Houston's Blue Willow Bookshop um, has sued to stop the law and so the judge is basically looking through an injunction. There's the Death Star bill, which is one of my favorite. The Star Wars references are oh, amazing. Yeah. It's a world killer, basically. Right. This is a bill that effectively right. says local control no more and uh, restrains what local governments can do significantly. We've also seen the courts reject that mail-in ballots can be rejected over ID problems. And this is a big problem for how the uh, state and how local governments have basically treated mail-in ballots. Um, and there's also, just by the way, pornography. Uh, right. should throw, the, the court has ruled basically in a favor of Pornhub, which is a pornography website, uh, in finding that age verification law required by the ledge violates the First Amendment. So where to start? Where to start? <sighs> well, it's a messy problem, yeah. right? It's also always a messy process. Uh, just to give you a little bit of context, uh, the um, legislature passed around more than 1,700 laws. Yes. Right. That's a lot of mm -hmm. laws. <laughs> so as a percentage, this is a small It is a small it's a small really number, but these were the most consequential laws. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, it's part of the legislative process. It's part of a healthy, you know, uh <laughs> process in which you still have uh some recuse with uh, the judicial <laughs> branch. Uh if the judicial branch uh, uh decides not to then you have the other avenues. Yeah. But it, it's a combination. I get it, Professor. Like, <laughs> yeah, like. It's an institutional story. But like the politics of this are really interesting, right? Yeah. What does it say about the state of play in Texas that all these laws are getting batted down, right? Or, or that they're all going to court, right, right. at least? Um, is the state moving too far to the right? Is there going to be pushback? Uh, or is this just sort of the natural course, like you say, that we're just going to work it all out and the system will well, tell us? Well, I think, you know, there is in politics, especially when we think about legislation, there's always this pendulum, right? So it swings to the left mm -hmm. and then it corrects and goes back to the center yeah. uh, and then goes back to the right. Yeah. So we have this motion. And I think this signals that not a lot of people are happy with these laws. Yeah. And a lot of people are challenging these laws because they're not happy with it. Now, the consequences for this electoral rear could be devastating for some, you know, uh, members of the of the Texas House or the Texas Senate in terms of seeking re-election because it just shows that people yeah. are not happy with these things. Yeah, I think that's right. And honestly, as a trade-off question, like where they're legislating about this but not about something else, then, right. you know, or maybe funding these things but not funding you know, other things, right. it certainly is a trade-off that people may not be that comfortable with, so it could be a problem. Another thing I think that's going to be a big problem is going to be one of these bills, and that's the Death Star Bill. The, this is House Bill 2127. You probably heard a little bit about it, but basically what it does is totally dismantle local ordinances around the state. Yep. Um, effectively, it sort of limits limits what local governments can do in terms of enforcement to only a handful of things that are set already in the Texas code. So what this basically does is to probably limit what local governments can do on some very functional things like you know, policing overgrown lots, policing insects and bees. Right. Um, a lot of things that get, um, has a lot of the sort of controversy has been about water breaks, right? Right. Um, which employers can still do privately, but the cities cannot mandate um, given this right. law. 
uh, outdoor festivals, heavy trucks, just a range of things that like local governments might regulate, but that the state law doesn't have in on the books. So either the state's got to change those things, which means they're basically just like the mayors of these, right. uh, they're like city council for all of these different counties right. now, or it doesn't get done. And the problem is that that law is very, very, very big, yes. right? Because it sends you to look at the other, uh, uh, I guess, uh, codes that have been implemented and other yeah. laws, right? Yeah. But in order to know if you as a city have control over insects and bees, right? <laughs> you don't know because it is so vague, yeah. right? Yeah. That you would have to sue the state in order for the state to say, oh, yes, by the way, yeah. yes, you can control insects and bees and this and that. So this is a first step, yeah. but this is going to have a cascade mm -hmm. of events mm. in courts for suing water breaks or these or that, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And obviously it's against, you know, the ethos of the Texas Constitution of home rule and allow cities to do that. So yeah. it's both ways. No, I mean, home rule no more, right? I mean, this yeah. was instituted basically in the kind of progressive era where local governments were best. And right. I think we're officially now a hundred years later, like, have seen that blow up, right? Hence the Death Star Bill, where it yeah. like has just destroyed this yep, world. Absolutely. Now some powers are saved here, so you know local governments are still able to you know maintain and build roads, levy taxes, doing public awareness campaigns, and all the kind of other local government you know employment issues. But there are a lot of things they can't do, and some of these cities really do have a lot of need for these kinds of things. Um, but you're right. Now basically the onus is on these organizations, like you know all these interest groups, or on individuals to say, hey, we think you're enforcing this right. law that's not legal. We're going to sue you. Which right means then that the local governments have to defend exactly. that. And so it's money, it's time, right. and just to be able to figure out how they're supposed to do it. The big news for the week is the impeachment trial of suspended Her Attorney General Ken Paxton. This has been a long time coming, but obviously the politics of this are very sharp. So let's talk about how this is going to go about. I guess my first question to you is, are people paying attention to this at all? The polling is a bit mixed on this. Generally speaking, most voters a plurality of voters say that the charges are, you know, definitely warranted, whereas, of course, for Republican voters, it's less so. But still, right. between 30 and 45 percent of right. Texans say, I don't know. Are people attentive to this or is it just us political nerds who are like, yes, <laughs> we want to see impeachment? Uh, I think, um, let me get, <laughs> yeah, it's us. It's just us. <laughs> yeah. I'm okay being alone on this, but, yeah, yeah, but yeah. you're right. I mean, it has implications actually. Because oh, yeah. One question that the court's going to have to consider is whether or not these things happen prior to the attorney general's election to office, because effectively the rules say that if these things happen before, then they're not impeachable. And so the court's going to have to make these decisions on several of these things. Yeah. Um, this is complicated because it gets into this question about what people know about this. If right. people knew and they forgive him and they voted for him anyway, then effectively impeachment's moot. So do you think this is going to happen? And how do we sort of anticipate this? Well, I don't think it's going to happen, right? Mm. Because, I mean, why going through the whole process, right? Why getting 60 Republicans yeah. in the House to impeach, uh, well, to, to, to uh, send articles of impeachment to the Senate yeah. if they know that this doesn't have any potential, yeah. you know, uh, outcome or whatnot. Yeah. So I think, you know, this is not going to, I mean, that particular point is not going to be moved because they're going to make the argument that, you know, uh, these issues were not known, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. in order for, you know, the public to have pardon, you need to know if suddenly, you know, new evidence mm -hmm. comes to, 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 to the floor, then, mm -hmm. right, you can make that argument. Yeah. So I don't think it's going to go that way. And I think that they're just going to go forward and mm -hmm. see. So in going forward, basically, they need to get two thirds of the Senate. Right. And that's 21 of the members to be able to vote to have either him guilty or to acquit. That means they need all 12 Democrats. Right. I think they're going to get the Democratic votes. Um, it's yep. my hunch. But they need nine Republicans. Yep. And that's the real sticking point here. Now, Angela Paxton, who is obviously married to Ken Paxton, is not able to participate. Correct. So, but she has to be there. But I'm going to ask you about that in a second. So they need to get basically nine Republicans to cross party lines and say, Ken Paxton, you're guilty of one of these 16 and then eventually right. 20 articles. Do you think that's going to happen? I mean, I think there's room for that. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, I think that if we look at what 
prominent Republican figures have said, you know, we have the Rick Perry, Carl Rove camp mm -hmm. that have said, like, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, mm -hmm. we should move forward Respect with this. Respect the process. Right. Yeah, was what and, saying, basically. Right? Yeah. And say, let's see what happens. And then you'll have the Steve Bannon uh, camp that says, no, this is a kangaroo court. Uh, yeah. This is just a Democrat-inspired witch hunt, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And I think that senators will have to make a decision in yeah. terms of what. But it's going to depend on how that evidence is presented. I think all senators know by now what's going to be at stake They've right now. Seen it, yes. And, you know, it's a defining moment for the Texas Republican Party. I think so. And that the only times we've really seen wholesale political change in the state has been following scandal. So this is definitely one of those things that the Republicans are worried about. And I think a lot of them look at this and say, Ken Paxson is a liability, and so we need to get rid of him. Other people say, Ken Paxson's a genius. <laughs> and right. we need to keep him because that's where the party's going. The politics of this are going to have to be sorted out, I think, in the jury here. So that's going to be interesting. Well, yeah, and obviously the role of Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. Yeah, uh, front and center. You know, mm -hmm. that's a legacy, you know, defining moment, mm -hmm. and he will need to be extremely politically astute, as you know, most of the times he is. Yeah. But you know, it's just going to be very interesting to see what unfolds in the next couple of weeks. True enough. I mean, the rules are set up, I think, to give him every benefit of the doubt, right? Even the standard, which is a criminal standard, you know, beyond a reasonable right. doubt. So conviction here is tough, and given the politics of it, even tougher. But they promise retribution, right? Now there's a gag order, so none of them can say anything. Right. But Ken Paxton, in my hometown of Plano, and his, I guess, adopted hometown of Plano, said that we're going to clean house. Basically, he is essentially targeting these members who have come after him. So if he is acquitted, I think it's going to be pretty much open season on these Republicans. And not that it's not always because elections do that, but it could be pretty ugly in the outcome. So we'll see. We'll see. But for this week, Brandon, that's it. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jeronimo Cortina. And I'm Brandon Roddinghouse. The conversation continues next week. Thank you.